So the first thing I want to talk to you about is collaborating with Ian because I know that you're not only the director, but you produced it and you're a co-screenwriter with Ian and Ian wrote the book. So I wanted to talk about, is there anything that didn't end up on the screen that was in the book that you guys probably had a little row about? <laughs> uh, you know, I know it's not exciting to talk about, I guess, because we actually really got along. Oh, good. And we actually really agreed, but we're very different. Um, so the way we worked on the script is he would do a pass, send it to me, and then I'd do a pass. It was a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we complemented each other in, in, in lots of ways. Um, but no, we, we, weirdly, we didn't have hardly any arguments. In fact, we just inspired each other. Well, that's beautiful to hear. I know that's a, it's a rare story, but it's true. It is rare, and I'm all there for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also want to talk about the fact that this feels like in 2023, the year of AI. There are a lot of films that have been released this year centering around AI. The Creator for 20th Century Fox, there's um, this one. There's two films that played at Venice here with Robert Zemeckis and Agro Drift that was directed by Harmony Kareen. And whenever I see films like this, I always think of an old school film, two old school films, Logan's Run. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and Blade Runner. Brilliant. <laughs> right. So I think of those two films, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on having a film that is kind of like, is centered in a, an apocalypse that's surrounded in the world of AI taking over our world. It takes place in, I think it's 2065. Yeah, so it, that's not that far away from now. No, it's all coming. You can all have a fake husband or wife whenever you want one. It's definitely coming. Um, I guess uh, it, it was weird when we when we I've been working on Faux for quite a few years now, so things were coming true as we were making it. So that was kind of alarming, um, mm. but there wasn't as many AI things going on when we started. Mm. But anyway, I guess what really interested me was this um, idea of how the science fiction elements of the story and the AI elements of the story gave us this propulsion to explore this marriage. Um, the idea that Hen could uh, have a relationship with a version of her husband like when she first met him was a really kind of really exciting idea to me. So yes, it, it, we do tackle the themes of artificial intelligence, but really it's a relationship story whereby these other elements really kind of enhance it. But I guess what it also does to me, the environment and the AI, I guess it's basically making it feel very imminent, you know, because it's kind of very close to us right now. And this sense, when you feel a ticking clock, you do reflect on how you're living your life. And I guess that's what I think these two elements really bring to the story. It's like, you know, we have a responsibility for the time that we have here and the lives that we're living. Um, so anyway, and consciousness is a pretty cool thing to explore too. Yeah, it is. I want to talk about, did you rehearse the scenes at all? Particularly, the two scenes I'm particularly in, um, thinking about are, are the, um, the one in the living room where they're, they're dancing and singing and carrying on and she wallops him upside the head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the, dinner, I, the dinner table? Yeah, the yeah. dinner table scene and then um, the interrogation or interview scenes. Did, did you rehearse those with the actors? Uh, no. So? No. Uh, no, I don't, look, I don't normally rehearse the scenes. Um, okay. We did rehearse the very big scene at the beginning when Terence arrives. That was like a, I hate to think how long it was, eight pages or something. Um, we definitely rehearsed that because it was, it's probably where the film is at its most awkward because there's so many secret rivers and conceits and lies and what's really you, there's a the story you think you're watching and the story that's really happening um and to try and find the calibration of that through camera and performance definitely performance was something i really needed to we needed to feel it and just get a taste of it um so we did actually rehearse the actual scene um so that was uh we like we rehearsed it for four days Wow. Just that one scene, just to try and find the flavour of the movie. Um, all the other things uh, I did in rehearsal was about um, relationships, character. Um, in fact, I took all the actors to a 
to a forest to rehearse. To rehearse. I just thought we should be around the living environment because for a long time we're going to be without a single tree and to really feel the pathos and the, the emotion of losing, losing the trees. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that that I do to kind of cement those deeper elements for the actors. I'm intrigued about this rehearsing in the forest situation. What exactly, so walk me through like maybe one of the days of rehearsal in the forest. What did you guys focus on mainly? Did you, did you just give them, was it an improv situation where you gave them some things to um, grasp onto and then they went from there or was it very structured? Uh, the days were pretty structured, so we definitely planned the days. Um, and sometimes it would be um, individual work or pairing. Um, sometimes it would be tasks where I'm not involved. I'd send them off to do something, um, like getting them to cook a meal in the kitchen and then going, going and finding a tree sitting under it. Hen, Hen has a relationship with trees in the story, so she went and had to go and find some particular trees, come back and talk about their personalities and things like that. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we would do. Um, I guess for me, these are the things that do something pretty special um, to to the actors and to their connection to the characters. What about Terence's character? Was he in the forest too? He didn't like forests. <laughs> and we're in Australia too, so he didn't like snakes or spiders, so he was quite afraid. So he was kind of in character. <laughs> Straight away. Um, look, I think, he, I think it did have an impact on him, definitely. But he was a little out of his comfort zone, for sure. Yeah, I, I could only imagine. Because Australia are known for those snakes and spiders, and it's not cute. <laughs> As someone who's been there. I want to talk about um, the scenes with Hen in the shower. They were shot twice. The one in the beginning that opens the film, and then the one where we just literally see her feet in the shower with the dirt being washed off. And I'm just curious to know if the opening scene is a washing away of whatever she's holding onto in that moment that starts the film and is the second one, the dirt and the guilt and the grime of, of knowing that she's gonna be living a different existence pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, I'm really sorry. You've just watched the movie and it's a bit of a head fuck. So I, I know that, like, it'll all be, it'll all be clear tomorrow. Um, so I guess um, uh, when you reflect back on, on it right now when we talk about it, um, the opening scene is really is, is, is the first night of the experiment. So her real husband has left for space. There's a, an artificial intelligence copy of her husband downstairs on the couch who's going to be turned on in a minute. Um, t so th th this, this night's going to start. She has no understanding of how real it's going to be. So the shower for me um, was basically her kind of feeling that sense of um, fear of agreeing to do this experiment, a sense of um, the first time being alone, her husband being away, and, and feeling that sense of time she's going to be doing this for. And then you'll notice the, 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 the shots following. It's almost like an, an actress preparing for stage, putting on the first, you know, putting on the layers, the armoring. So the first shot is her is how she it's her fear, mm. if you know what I mean. Can she, and does I she do. have the courage? Um, so that's that's really the emotional aspect of that shot. But the plug in the bath is really she saves the water for her tree, um, which is symbolic of this is how she lives her life. And at the end, there is no plug in the bath so she's you know she's leaving I guess but yes the the mud is absolutely symbolic of of washing away the stuff that she's been holding the reason I ask that is because when I particularly in my personal life have had a really <laughs> rough day I love to take a shower and just wash the day off of me right and let it go down the drain with whatever came in the house with me and then once it's down the drain I can move on to a renewed spirit and a renewed sense well, yeah, it's also um, when she was in the relationship with Junior when he was there, um, that was her place that she could emote, you know, and, and quite, you know, privately. So there was definitely that. Um, and, um, and I guess the piano is the other place that she could emote in the music, you know, like maybe explore those feelings that she hasn't had the courage to kind of voice with him. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the interview scene and I want to know what was the choice to have 
Jr. face the wall as opposed to face Terrence as he was talking to them to him and all he heard was his voice and Terrence has this eerily calm like resonant voice so it's the kind of voice that either can soothe you to sleep or can get on your last nerve <laughs> you know what I mean yeah a couple of questions there um I guess the, the the posture of the situation was all to do with the way that he's monitoring his brain and 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 it's also just a very Ian Reid it's just weird um and, and kind of to raise a lot of questions for the audience, like what, what's really going on here, I guess. So definitely to kind of create kind of a, a, a nodness, but it's, he's, he's basically being monitored. And then in terms of Terence's, um, his kind of, his, his ways, I guess, um, he, I mean, really what he's trying to do is he's trying to, it feels like almost like, evil provocation half the time like it's like he's really really pushing him and provoking him but ultimately what he's trying to do is is break his rigidity you know like he knows the real junior is very he's he's, clo he's closed down he's he's not spontaneous anymore and i guess he's trying to make the experiment as exciting as possible he wants to know can he break it how far can he push it um so there's all of that but to do that properly he can't he, it, it's that mixture of um provocation and charm distraction so we had to find the rhythm and the tempo of the dialogue and and a way in his performance so suddenly it felt real and then it was charming and it was friendly was that a joke wasn't it a joke um so you're very disorientated so yeah um Aaron Pierre did it beautifully the other thing that we to try and make it feel very grounded too is we kind of brought in this kind of paternal feeling uh to his performance and I said it's almost like imagine you've had a son in a relationship early in your life and you left that relationship and the son doesn't know that you exist mm. and you've come back to live with him, you know, 20 years later. You know, that kind of idea, like, he's your son but he doesn't know you're, you're the father and, and just little things, little notes like that really brought some, some of that kind of creator feeling to it, the, that kind of paternal quality. So all of that's in there um, in those, and gives that richness. Thank you for that. I, I was really interested to know what that was about. And yes, I just want to give some some props to Aaron Pierre because I did watch his work before when he was in the Underground Railroad, directed by Barry Jenkins, and he was phenomenal in that, and he's even more grounded and phenomenal in this. I wanted to know, and, and the other thing is, you know, you usually don't see people of color in those types of roles in sci-fi movies. You don't really see us in sci-fi movies at all. So I'm wondering if the character was written to be a person of color in the script and in the book, or if you guys just got the best person for the role. And I'm imagining you just got the best person for the role. That's totally how I work, definitely. Um, he also had to, whoever we cast, had to feel very different to the other two, like physically you know um, we didn't want Junior to feel like he could just physically remove him from the space so you know Aaron has this un beautiful stature and he has these beautiful eyes I just for whatever reason I just wanted someone that was beautiful you know <laughs> um, to kind of come in and just these eyes um, so yeah I was just yeah it, I always go for the best the, the best soul I guess and um, here was this beautiful man that came across our our desk and um, he he has this incredible ability to bring truth to everything he's doing in the character like he actually believes that this is going to enhance humanity you know and um, he found ways to make that feel very truthful thank you yeah he's fantastic uh He's real, he really is, and so are Paul and, and so are Sharon, and they just, the three of them together work really, really well. It was, it was a great combination of, of acting talent put together. I wanna talk about this Skeeter Davis song, and I wanna know, the lyrics from it, I just wanna read a little bit of it. Don't you know it's the end of the world because you don't love me anymore. I felt like it was dealing with the loss of love in addition to the actual end of the world, the apocalyptic thing that I was speaking about earlier with you know the dust storms and the drought and the rain and all of that. And I just want to know, what was your thought process in selecting the music for the film? Because that one, when I, because you can hear the lyrics to that song very, very clearly. And I just wanted to know what the thought process was with the musical selection. Yeah, I guess, um, 
we really like the idea that um, the house is almost like a haunted house. It's like it's got the ghosts of, you know, Junior's family, the generations of his family have been living in this house and Hen is just the next matriarchal, not matriarchal, the next woman in line of the patriarchal um, generational thing. And I guess we kept coming across all this nostalgic music um, and it just feels like all these women yearning, you know, in this in this old music. It always felt like people yearning a loved one or yearning to do something different or to be somewhere else. So something about the period and I guess the the, the, the qual that yearning quality in the music was something that just felt like it wasn't just Hen's music, it was probably all of the women's music before her as well. My mother, their mother, this mother, next mother, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and then every now and then we'd stumble across a track that may have lined up nicely with the themes of the film as well. But you'll notice that, yeah, pretty much everything she listens to is very nostalgic. Was, were the songs that she played on the piano, were those original compositions? Yes. Yes, yeah, so very early on, I really wanted to get that composed and find who that was going to be. And it was a, a this really beautiful artist called Agnes Obel. Um, she's Danish born, lives in Berlin. And um, she had never done a score before um, and sent her the script and she just fell in love with Hen. She said, I know this woman. I said, great. <laughs> and, um, and then we, um, we had a long conversation and I sent her this really detailed but simple brief uh, and she, I just encouraged her to not think about doing scores or pieces of music, like just play for each, you know, each emotional arc. So she did give me five minutes, two minutes, ten minutes, um, and she was just channeling Hen in, in, in those particular moments. And uh, the, I, I didn't really change anything. She just found it, like, so precisely. It was beautiful. The music was really, really beautiful. Just to lighten it up a little bit, Garth, what was up with the Beatle, dude? The Beatle was just showing up in closets, showing up in sinks. I'm not allowed to talk about the Beatle. Really? Ian Reid said, do not talk about the Beatle. Oh, no. Well, we can talk about it if you want. <laughs> what was it for you? <laughs> what was it for me? Yeah. I couldn't figure out if the Beatle was a camera. Uh -huh. I couldn't figure out if the Beatle was some fu some uh, throwback futuristic sign of what they were about to go into. Like, I just couldn't figure out what it was representative of, but I knew it was representative of something. Um, everyone should have their own interpretation, and it's correct. <laughs> um, He's like, I, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine. No, but I've, I've got my version of it, um, and I guess what I found fascinating... Look, we all had lots of ideas of what it could be, mm -hmm. We knew it, it. We knew it did something to us when we had it in the script. Like it, it did something to us. It made us feel something. So we were definitely keen on that. Um, and then as we were making it, 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 it became clearer, especially to me. I mean, what was interesting to me was that both, both the junior AI and the hen AI. I hope you guys know that there was a replacement at the end. <sighs> That's close. Um, they both have this, it's very fascinating that the artificial intelligence see a beetle for what it is rather than a pest. And it's kind of a, like a Buddhist idea, I guess. We, we, we forget how to see. You know, when we're born, we see a flower in all of its glorious wonder. Now we just walk past them and, you know, it's for Valentine's Day or something like that. We don't see it for what it is. And there's something really magical about these AIs just drawn to this glorious creature you know and kind of fascinated by it and there's something about that 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 we've lost but the AI has so I thought that was very interesting it's so interesting that you brought up the Buddhist concept I'm Buddhist and we always hearken back to the lotus flower and how it's the only flower that thrives in mud right well, there you go so that's all right we on we on the same wavelength Garth okay oh, man, I'm we're gonna start it. these chairs are gonna lift <laughs> It's elevated me to another level. We're going level. out. We're going out. <laughs> I want to talk about the cinematography because it was really beautiful, particularly um, the scenes where we see that really large, um, wide shot of the landscape where it's kind of pinkish and white with little elements of green here and there, and then we get to see a close up when Hen and Junior are walking through it. Is that supposed to be? just straight up mud? Is it supposed to be rim of the earth that maybe got annihilated or something? Like what was that representative Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the earth is the other character in the film 
and um, this idea of feeling the earth dying, it's bleeding, it's, it's, it's been abused and, and reused and abused and it, it's kind of, it's hurting. It's like a, a, a whale that's been beached, you mm. know, and it's starting to rot, you know. It's, um, but also, you know, they do talk about how, how dying can be beautiful. So it's almost like you're kind of drawn by the images, you're drawn by the beauty of the landscape, but at the same time, it's dying. So it's almost that idea that we're blind to our death in a way, like where we're heading with the environment. Mm. We all know it's, we're being told it's there, but we're just, I don't know, we've just got a blind eye to it. Um, we shot that in, um, in South Australia. Um, yeah, so salinity, industrial runoff, probably was what we were thinking about with the pink. It was like, really beautiful. It was also, in terms of a grounded sci-fi, that was our, that was like going to the other planet. In okay. a way, so the the Earth became our other planet. So when we think of faux, after this audience has watched it and myself, I've seen it a few times. I look at it and I think it's part psychological thriller. I think it's a little bit of horror here and there. I think it's um, a drama. I think it's a love story. I think it's so many things. With you coming out on the other side of it, how do you view it at this point? Oh, look, I totally, for me, it's totally Hen's story. And I guess what Hen fights for is what the movie's looking into. And I think Hen is someone that appreciates the preciousness of our life, how little time we have left, and how we're just, we're just asleep at the wheel. And she doesn't want to be asleep anymore. So I guess the film is just, I guess, raising questions around... We're not making judgments necessarily, we're just making questions around, okay, life is real, there's stuff on the horizon, are we being kind to each other? Are we living the life we want to live? And, and I guess that, that's what Hen is trying to bring through. All those other elements uh, is the roller coaster we sit in to go on it, but, but, but the through line of the story is definitely that for me. I want to ask you about the note that Hen leaves where she says... When in the interview with Terrence, she says that, yeah. you know, if what, he asked her what she would do, and she said, I would just leave a note, a blank note, because it says everything and nothing at all. I want to know your thoughts on that, because that's such a huge statement in a life that she has where she's going, she's going through a roller coaster of emotions. She's in two different relationships, really. She's in a relationship with one junior and another junior. One is, is a little cold and a little distant, and the other one is very, very affectionate. And she's dealing with all of that. So for, for her to get to a place where she just wants to leave a blank piece of paper says a lot, but says nothing at all. Yeah, I think that she said everything she had to say. You know, she, she said everything at the dinner table and he said everything he had to say too. Like, there's nothing out there for you. I mean, there's nothing cruel that you could say to someone like that. Um, and I guess the blank note is um, that's the only way he's going to understand. It's not what she's going to say to him, I guess. So it's, you know, uh, it's a very powerful way to leave, I think. And... Um, and you can see, you can see on the screen him trying to understand what that means. And he doesn't even know that it was over in the rain. He doesn't even, he hadn't even, he didn't even register. Um, and I guess this is the whole point of the blank note is him to actually, he's got to work it out for himself. Well, I save that for the end because this film is the kind of film that it can say everything or it can say nothing at all. It all depends on your interpretation of exactly. it. Exactly. Right? Depends who's watching it and how you're watching it. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're spiritually close, forget it. Probably go and see something else. <laughs> um, but if you, if this resonates with you, then it'll, it'll take over you for sure. Absolutely. Well, Garth Davis, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Film Independent for doing this Q&A around your film, Foe. It was fantabulous. It was very thought-provoking, very deep on so many different levels, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, as I'm sure the audience that stayed for the Q&A did too. So everyone, if we could please just give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, watching it. Appreciate it. And thank you so much. I'm Carla Renata, your moderator. Please be safe going home, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much. You're welcome.